Grand. So we're live. <laughs> Hello, uh, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us here. Um, I am Greg Flett. I am one of the board members for Waverly Care, uh, and I've been uh, very kindly asked to come along today and to chair um, for today's event, which is um, an event to coincide with World AIDS Day and is about social inequalities and HIV in Scotland and the work that uh, Waverly Care and particularly SX as part of Waverly Care do uh, in that area. I am joined today um, by um, our three panellists. Uh, I'll introduce them in no particular order. It's Sam Abdullah from the Caledonian Thebans, um, and he's the publicity officer there. And when the season isn't cancelled by COVID, he plays as a hooker. Outside of rugby, Sam lectures in learning disability nursing at Edinburgh Napier University, where he also co-chairs the LGBT plus network for staff. I'm also joined today by Oliver Wayne, who is a peer engagement officer at Waverly Care and is the primary, primary researcher in Waverly Care's study, There Needs to Be Care Throughout, which explored the access of non-binary people, trans men and trans women to sexual health services in Scotland and was a fantastic read for anybody who's not had the chance to read it yet. And lastly, I'm joined by Christopher Ward and Christopher is the health improvement coordinator based in Edinburgh and the Lothians with SX. And just for those who, anybody who's joining us today that doesn't know, SX is Waverly Care Service for gay and bisexual men and all men who have sex with men across Scotland. So I have been asked to just cover off some brief housekeeping points. Uh, I myself have currently got boiler repairmen in, so I might need to disappear at some point and I'll, I'll leave it to one of our panelists to pick up in my absence. I'm just that Oliver may also need to pop off quickly uh, at uh, short notice so if you see any of our cameras going off then that is the reason why and um, throughout the talk today uh, there, there is the ability to ask questions and you should have the option to do that on your screen through the Q&A function those questions will be moderated and passed to um, us and we'll try and bring those into the conversation as well um, and do just use that function use the chat function and uh, try and share your comments with us um, if we have any te technical difficulties today, just try and dial in again. It shouldn't close down completely as long as some of us are still here, hopefully. Um, and we will try and take questions that are on topic uh, midway and questions at the end of the session as well. So I will probably just move on to the first question, um, which is a pretty wide ranging one. Uh, and, and one that I think we can all recognize um, that the, there are many, not all, but many political, social and legal milestones for LGBT plus people that which have been reached. Um, and what is the current situation um, for gay and bisexual men and men who have sex with men living in Scotland? So I'm quite happy to pick that one up to start with. But, um... I suppose the first thing I'd say is that there, as there has been many breaches and gains in terms of legal backgrounds as well as moral ones, there's a lot of things that are still um, an issue for gay and bisexual men living in Scotland. So, for example, um, research tells us that GBMSM, there's just the abbreviated version to speed it up, um, actually experience worse mental health outcomes than the rest of the populations living in Scotland. And still in Scotland today, GBMSM are still likely to become HIV positive more than other populations. We've had loads of different advances, particularly when we're talking about World AIDS Day and HIV, we've had PrEP, and we've also had U equals U. And these are great medical advancements which come with a lot of social change as well. So PrEP, for example, in an American study was shown to actually reduce anxiety and increase pleasure between couples, particularly for gay and bisexual men. But I think the because the question is quite broad and wide reaching, it's to acknowledge that the situation is different for loads of GBMSM and that can be dependent on whether they're living with a disability, whether they're a person of colour, whether they're impacted by poverty and also where they live in Scotland. And quite a lot of the questions around their um, well-being and health is down to access and visibility within services. And I think that's one thing, particularly in SX, we're keen to address is that ability for men to access regardless of where they live in Scotland and also for their community to be visible to them anywhere in Scotland. I'm glad Chris went first. 
because it meant that we didn't have an awkward couple of minutes of everyone just waiting for someone to start speaking. Um, I, 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 Chris made some brilliant points. And I think when we think, particularly around when we think about the intersection of um, uh, LGBT plus identities, identities um, and any other kind of protected characteristic, we know that that's still more, more difficult and still faces more adversity than um, those of us who are kind of privileged enough or born with with with, uh, with white privilege. Um, and I think we need to remember that the all of the milestones that we've reached, that the situation is still dynamic and that just because we've got to this point doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to stay at this point, that things can slide back the way if we don't continue to to push for change, to, to push for more inclusive policies, to push for more inclusive healthcare, to, to push for all of the things that um, some of us are fortunate enough to now experience. We, if we take the foot off the gas, then there is the risk of, of, of backslide. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, and, and just generally reflects the fact that no matter how far we have come as a society, there are, is always more to be done um, on, on inclusion and particularly at the point you were saying about intersectionality and, and those, partic those people who are particularly vulnerable to still experience many of the difficulties with being GBMSM and how it is that they, those, those issues which m might feel like they've been historically addressed are not addressed within their communities or for people with, with other issues, disabilities, for example. Um, and, and yet we, we, there is, there's always work to be done and there is always that fear that no matter how much work is done, I think uh, things could slide back. I think there's been um, like, there's always you know especially with people with multiple marginalizations there's always going to be this other part of you that's still in some other way oppressed so you can be gay and black and then your blackness doesn't ever get removed from your gayness but you're still struggling with racism and the same goes with disabled people and trans people um and i think there's still especially with trans rights issues like there's still a lot to a lot to, to do and to happen and like a lot of going on. Um, I think with the um, Gender Recognition Act stuff at the moment, like, and it's a clear a big example of where things are sliding back and we see that um, people with like anti-trans views who also have behind those anti-trans views, anti like well, homophobic views and misogynistic views, but they're sort of by, oppressing one minority are still at chipping away at these other wins that we've had as gay men and like you know things can crumble quite quickly and easily if we let other people being continue being oppressed um so yeah um i think it's quite hard still being i, I think of like in terms of the current situation living in scotland there's still like do we have any out gay footballers yet I don't think we do like when will that happen and like there's there's plenty of things that's like oh it's 2020 why are we all thinking about this and it's like well no we still got loads of to, loads to do and loads, loads of places to go um I don't follow football so um someone else can tell me if if there are any out gay footballers because I think that's it there isn't but I don't know <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll leave it there <laughs> I don't know if any of us follow football, so we'll we'll just assume that you're right um, and take that as gospel. Um, but yeah, I, th I think kind of what you're getting at though is that that idea that actually there's there's no equality until we're all equal kind of idea. And actually, yeah, we can celebrate all the uh, the the way we've come, and I don't think that we should ever take away from how far we've come. But it's still really, I tried my best not to swear there. It's it's still not great for a lot of people. Um, and, and and we can't forget that just because things are, are, are good for some of us um, currently. I keep saying currently just because I'm, <laughs> I, I, I keep it in my mind. Like, and I think it's, I know it's not here. I know it's America, but like when we look at the stuff that happened with, with trans people in the military, but that just happened. And at the moment, none of the, none of the protections that were offered um, as LGBT plus people are kind of built into the, the, the constitution of the United Kingdom. They're all laws, and laws can all be overturned. 
um, I've suddenly become very nervous because the lawyer has just appeared back on my screen and here I am talking about the law. Um, so un until that kind of huge scale change happens, everything that has happened can be taken away um, just by a, a change in government and a change in direction. So it's worth being mindful of that. And I think you're completely right, particularly when we're talking about World AIDS Day, we're talking about how much uh, we've thrived because the community have come together and forced governments and groups to like bend to our pressure because ultimately the community is the most knowledgeable about their own experiences and their needs. So I think that's the key thing we should focus on in the World AIDS Day is about the strength of community and how really without all the people that we've lost in previous years down to HIV and AIDS is that we like I think the phrases people commonly say is we stand on the shoulder of giants and that without them, we wouldn't have reached the potential of what we've got today with treatment and with this kind of battle against stigma. Okay, does everyone have any more comments on question one? Okay, I don't think we've had any comments come in yet. So I um, might move on to question two which is covering, um, I guess it's probably one of those things that tied in hand in hand with a lot of the things we've just been talking about, but that mental health um, is a much uh, wider and more broadly discussed topic of conversation. And what things do each of you think impact on GBMSM's mental health and what can be done to improve their mental health? I'm happy to have a go at this one. Um, uh, as I wrote some notes and I just put austerity and oppression and like minority stress and capitalism like a bunch of other stuff that you know they, they affect the whole of society but I think people who are more marginalized are going to affect even more and end up more likely to be in poverty more likely to then be experiencing um, mental health issues as a result and and you know when you've got minority stress and stigma on top of the things that the struggles of like everybody in society is dealing with well yeah i think everyone even perhaps the billionaire like do the billionaires suffer from capitalism i don't know um but like er, yeah those things like the big ones those ones which people because people are going to say like oh like discrimination and stuff and i'm like yeah but all of the other ones as well those ones too they're bad um <laughs> anyone got any further comments on that I think at the moment, um, kind of global context, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, other than HIV and AIDS, there is another pandemic um, that's that's happened in our lifetime. Um, so I think the, the mental health of um, GB, MSM, uh, and actually LGBT plus people more broadly is going to again be more significantly impacted by some of the, the byproducts of uh, dealing with COVID. When we consider things like like lockdowns, which I'm not about to turn into a, an anti-lockdown, anti-masking rant. Don't worry, it's fine. Um, nobody's going to have to have to mute my madness. Um, but I do think that some of the, the the stuff where we think about people who don't have access to their their, their chosen families because they live at home um, and they're not out to their parents, or they live with people who they don't feel comfortable being out around, and that kind of being cut off from the, the community that they're part of and not being able to live authentically, all of that feeds into the stuff that Oliver was talking about. And at the moment, I think that is so much more heightened because nobody or people don't have as much access to that, that, that escape that they, they, they had before. Um, I know for me personally, my mental health around um, being, take, being brought into lockdown was, was huge because it cut me off from um, the people who I love and the things that I love to do and the people who I, I choose to be around. And yes, we can we can do things like this where we we meet up with our friends on a Saturday night and, and, and do a quiz and accidentally drink two bottles of wine or whatever it is that, that you do. But there is something about being around, for me, other queer people that just brings my energy back up um, and, and gets me going through the, through the next kind of four days until I see them again. So I think at the moment, the impact of mental health, along with those kind of long standing structural things like capitalism, boo, um, that normally impact our mental health, the, 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 the state of the world and how we're having to respond to keep ourselves well is, is making that so much more kind of, not prevalent, but uh, making me feel it more strongly anyway. 
I think Sam made some really good points, particularly around, so we know from research that gay and bisexual men already had poor mental health. In fact, that in one survey, over half of the participants had said they experienced some poor form of mental health in the last year. And then we had COVID on top of that. So we've already been put on the back foot. But I think when it comes to things that are really helpful for mental health, connection is one of those biggest ones feeling that services are actually prepared to support their needs and I would be understanding of their situation so they don't feel stigmatized or um, any sense of judgment about the relationships or what they're about. But I think in the main essence, it's speaking to someone potentially through like a one-to-one -one support or maybe a counseling thing. But in reality, that's just about having your experiences validated and your situation recognized. And quite that's really important for a situation to be able to make you have better mental health. But there are many things that I think gay and bisexual men across Scotland have that can negatively impact the mental health, such as homophobia, judgmental language, stigma, um, even stigma around HIV as well, that can massively impact the mental health. And awareness and understanding of that is only going to help reduce it. But I think about Sam's sort of thing is talking about doing activities together is actually one of those big things sometimes i think through zoom there is this pressure that you have to form conversation you have to like think of something interesting or different to say to the person that no i haven't actually just been sat in my house all week i actually went out for a walk on wednesday whereas actually doing an activity together is about that connection but not trying to explain yourself you just understand as queer people around queer people that you get each other and that you accept each other and one of the questions that's come in uh, while we've been chatting, um, some of the other questions we'll probably pick up um, at the end when we've got more time to just kind of answer general questions. But one of the ones that's very much on topic is uh, controversially, um, do you think that LGBT plus culture is a contributing factor to mental health uh, or to poor mental health in some people? And he's highlighted, for example, um, vanity or sex shaming, etc. And I think um, probably, Christopher, that's kind of picking up on some of the points that you were just talking about there. Like I think um, LGBT people, like all other people, can be guilty of some bad habits and bad behaviors. But I think ultimately it comes down to how those cultures interact online and how online social media can exacerbate those issues as well. But I think as humans, we're guilty of bad behavior as well as good behavior. But I don't think LGBT culture inherently is contributing to those. I don't know what other panelists think about that. Um, I have some thoughts. I mean, I think that there's some amount of like internalizing the pressures of like how other people so one of the things I've written down was pressure to be a certain way um which can be from people who aren't LGBT and then as an LGBT person you internalize that and then put it onto other people um it definitely happens within the trans community um and then I think so I don't think it's necessarily the LGBT culture itself is the problem but it's the that we can rep we can replicate the oppressions that we are experiencing onto other people within our community um, by policing how they should be, how their sexual behavior should be, and like it basically being the right kind of or like the good gay. Um, so I think I don't think it's the culture. Like I can definitely say I've had some of my best, most positive mental health experiences are at a drag night, like having the time of my life with all of my pals. Um, and I think some of us could say the same, like the, the culture can be the high point rather than a, a low point and a pressure. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Sam? I, I, I think probably the, the, the idea of LGBT culture is too, too nuanced to say that it's, it's completely to blame for um, some of the more negative aspects or impact on our mental health. Um, but there are certainly parts of LGBT culture which will influence us like um, Oliver just said kind of be the idea that you need to present in a certain way or you need to behave in a certain way or you're not sexy unless you look like this so you're not you're not important unless this happens and I think that that probably impacts all of us um, which is why I think it's really important that we we, we develop some of the uh, an understanding of some of the things that protect us from that and the the things that we know this has a negative impact on me so so what factors do i have in my life which can help support me and and recognize that actually i i don't need to put all of my energy into thinking actually what this stranger on instagram says about the way i look is really important 
or because I don't conform to the, the idea that this is this is how a gay man behaves, um, that I'm, I'm I'm wrong or anything like that. We we it's it's really important that we have people around us who can help us identify some of the things that actually are our strengths and and are the reason why we're valid and important, um, and that we we are we are without sounding trite and cliche, we are exactly who we're meant to be. Um, I sound like somebody's fairy godmother, emphasis on fairy. Um, and uh, I, I, I just, uh, yeah, as much as that stuff's there, there's, we need to work on our, our own protective factors. And that might come from people, it might come from things, it might come from uh, anywhere, but we need to identify those to help protect against the, the negative aspects of, of LGBT plus culture. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. The, the, the sort of the, if you look at cast the net too wide amongst the LGBT community and try and be all things to all people within that community, you're probably on a hiding to nothing. But if you can find your own community within that who celebrate you and support you, and then the kind of the positive impact that that can have on your mental health to have people around you who don't need you to be any other kind of LGBT other than than you are. Um, it can can be really uh, really important, and it's it's not always easy to find that. But uh, for me personally, that that's the thing that's given me the gift to to be the precious little flower that I am, <laughs> without any judgment. So yeah, that, for, for that that's that's certainly for me um, massively important. And I think I think one of the things that was really important for for mental health um, and addressing the root causes of some of the the, the main causes of poor mental health within the LGBT community is just constantly working to try and remove that stigma um, and although there's great, been great societal changes in that I think one of the most important changes recently um, is looking at inclusive education and um, because if I had known that other LGBT people existed in the world and was told about them on a daily basis and just just had those experiences normalized then I would have looked at those and thought well I'm normal too and I wouldn't have grown up with that sense of shame about being you know who I am. I think one of the and, and this might kind of come on to one of the the questions that's still in the, the webinar to so tell me if I'm breaking the rules um, but what I think one of the nicest things that I've I have as a, a, a lecturer is that I see young people um, coming through um, the university and young people, or at least I think, young people are so much more openly queer than I ever would have felt brave enough to be at their age. And that was, I mean, I'm not that old. Like we're talking kind of 15 years ago um, when these 18 year olds are coming through and like just being as queer as you like and don't care and it's just, that's one of the things where I think back to the first question and you go, actually the changes that have happened in our lifetime have enabled that young person to feel confident enough that they can be exactly who they want to be. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's not all doom and gloom, um, but I do think that kind of that, that openness and that, that again, going back to kind of cliche sayings is you, you can't be what you can't see and the visibility of LGBT plus people um, I think it has a really will have a really positive impact on people accessing um, sexual health services yes there's still huge amounts of stigma um, and there's still huge amounts of stigma within kind of older people um, I'm including all of you in this I have no idea how, how old any of you are um, but still kind of those conversations of you know making jokes about STIs making jokes about um, going to get tested all of that stuff contributes to this um, but I do think we're moving in a positive direction yeah I'd agree and I think that thing around visibility is really key because I actually just saw one of the questions in the chat was about how like the digital environments helping people feel isolated in, well, relieving isolation in remote and rural parts of Scotland. And I think, again, that comes back to Sam's point about visibility, because social media is a double-edged sword in the sense that it can be really affirming to see people like you and give you ideas about how you can live your life and kind of inspire you and may basically make you feel seen. But also, as Oliver said, it could make you feel that you need to reach these certain levels of representation or you need to look a certain way to actually fit in with the culture. But I don't know what people think about social media and effect on mental health. I think we've covered it in kind of the questions anyway, but um, how do they feel? Because social media is now one of the more focused places now that the pandemic has made us go more online. So 
I've personally sometimes found social media really harming for my mental health and then sometimes found it fantastic when actually engaging with people. But I don't know what other panelists think of it. Well, I think it can, it, yeah, it can be harmful and positive. Like there's a lot of, I guess, minority organization and community organization happens on social media. Um, and there's definitely valuable resources on Facebook that mean I can't ever really leave Facebook unless, and is there another platform that could deliver a community group that has 3000 people sharing information about healthcare that they don't get otherwise? Like, you know, if you can't rely on the NHS to provide a certain like service because the wait times are three years long, then, you know, community organizations sometimes have to happen in these spaces which are owned by people who don't have our best interests at heart. Um, so yeah, ultimately it's going to be both toxic and um, constructive and like community organizing. And it's it's even harder now. There's no real way of um, having in-person meetings as well. Um, yeah, but I, you know, that the person who said um, is the pandemic and new, new digital environment helping reach those feeling isolated. It's definitely helped reach uh, disabled people who felt isolated for years and have asked for online versions of events or streaming of events for years and suddenly it's all accessible to them um, and they've got a window into an environment they previously felt excluded from so yeah I think there's definitely been really positive parts of the, the digitalization of a lot of our media um, yeah I don't know Okay, um, if no one else has any other comments, we can move on to the next question, um, which looks at what social barriers remain when it comes to HIV testing and how can we overcome them? Um, and I wonder actually if that might uh, tie into some of the questions that have come in on the Q&A function as well. I'm happy to talk about testing, mainly because it's what SX was set up to promote and achieve and things like that. but. Um, yeah, particularly with social barriers, that goes back again to stigma and judgment and kind of feeling unable to access testing for multiple of reasons. But I think COVID was a big hit at the start because loads of sexual health services had to pull back from face to face. We had to stop our um, testing that we were doing drop-ins. The idea that you would do a drop-in anything these days is insane. But I think it enabled us to think about new ways of testing. So in April, we launched HIV self-test in collaboration with HIV Scotland, which was a great success. I think over 3,500 tests went across Scotland. And for me, that was really a question about access. The fact that people could get it so convenient and have it sent straight to the home and really have control over that element of their life, people really responded to that. And we recently put out, um, a report and a review of the service so far and I think it was around 95% said they would recommend the test to someone and that almost over half people said they did it because of the convenience and the ease of testing but there is so many different methods that people can get testing I think in Brighton they have vending machines that people can just attend to order their tests and I think it's about finding new ideas and new methods to actually make testing reachable for communities and also just make the language as accessible and the content as accessible as possible. I suppose that one of the biggest social barriers that will always be there with HIV is stigma um, and stigma is treated by education again and um, it's just the, the kind of thing that if, if people can be educated about what HIV is now, not what they they have presented to them still in the media, because you know HIV stories are still the, the prevalent ones are ones where people were still dying of HIV, um, and if you can try and get that message, me those messages out around U equals U, and and have people understand those, then the stigma around HIV hopefully should re should reduce as a result, and, and people may feel more confident in in accessing testing. I think the stats um, that you were referring to, Christopher, were, were incredible about the HIV home test, particularly about people who had never accessed HIV testing before. And um, so th that maybe that is one important way of uh, addressing stigma is just being allowing people to do this in the comfort of their own homes. 
I can um, chat a little bit about where this might align with some of the research that we did um, with Waverly Care um, in the There Needs to Be Care Throughout report. We actually looked at like barriers to sexual health services um, faced by like trans and non-binary people. Um, and that obviously includes HIV testing as well um, in, an, in a kind of framework of like, what are the individual barriers? What are the political barriers? What are the um, systematic barriers? I think I'm getting the words wrong there, but one of them was the social barriers. Um, and a lot of the time, like people had struggled because they hadn't been, this is also hard because we did this before COVID times. And so we'll talk about things like people weren't allowed companions and appointments and now appointments are very different. But a lot of the time people had, the, from my recollection, there had been a lot of um, desire for, like a lot of people had said, look, I'd really like a remote way of testing where I wouldn't have to go into that space. Um, partly because of like sometimes people were just living in such a remote area they had to travel for a very long way to get a sexual health service like to test them at all and partly because of the convenience issues and sometimes your sexual health service is housed in the same building as the gender clinic and you might not want to be you might not want to be out about your sex life to your gender clinicians and trying to avoid that like a, a remote service kind of helps there um, so there's some there's certain social barriers that face trans people that are unique like some of the time as well um, a lack of information that's specific to trans people has been really difficult um, and finding community generated information on YouTube and Facebook can be unreliable or inconsistent um, and that's where I think Chris, would you like to talk about the Essex website, um, the new information? Um, yeah, I think a big bit that um, Oliver and I worked on was the trans men content update for the website. And a big section of that was actually about accessing services and things to be mindful of when accessing services as well. But it's all to do with the fact that information needs to be reliable and also come from like a kind of one concrete source that people can feel confident that any information they use on that website would be beneficial for them or have come from someone with a lived experience. Because I think lived, you can't really pass up lived experience when you come to accessing testing services or even thinking about sexual health. And a big part of uh, the SX website is because we're very sex positive. We talk about sexual pleasure a lot because I think as typically people remember from school, when you went for your sexual health education, it was like this horrible image and this horrible image and never do it and God will judge you, things like that. And um, I think we really need to change that conversation because it will make people feel more responsible and accessible for their sexual health because they'll just be like, it's just part of my health. I enjoy having sex, sex is a good thing and you need to get tested just to keep on top of it. That's as simple as it has to be. One of the um, facilitators we'd found in the research as well was genuinely access to sexual inf health information within a community space that can be online or in physical physical space. So within a community space like SX that has, you know, clearly it's for gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. If you can have like, look, here's the trans section, here's sexual health information for you. It can be trusted and it can be um, safe. Um, yeah. I think there's, there's something in it about the kind of the public health messaging around sexual health and it's still very much targeted to, towards specific populations and there's obviously there's reasons for that there's to do with the vulnerability and to do with prevalence but I do think there's something kind of in what Chris was saying in that actually when do we just start talking about kind of looking after your sexual health as, as kind of everyone's business as you know you go to your dentist every six months so you should be going to your for your sexual health screening every six months just as part of the general population's approach approach to their health it's not just a this group of people's thing to consider um and i i, I don't know how we we change the conversation to that um, but it's something i think we in as a broader population need to be thinking about and the education thing i think is is really key starting starting young starting in school talking about sex is not just this kind of awful thing um that if yeah, it always makes me think of in mean girls where he's writing on the board you will get chlamydia and you will die have some rubbers that kind of situation um and even kind of in nursing education we've got a a, a lecturer who does an absolutely incredible job in chipping away at people to make sure that 
sexual health is part of the curriculum for, for student nurses. But it started off small and, and, and they've grown it bigger and bigger. Um, and they do an incredible job. But that's kind of one voice in a sea of voices. And we need to make sure that everyone, particularly people who are trained in health professionals, need to be aware that you need to think about sexual health for absolutely everyone. It's so intrinsic, or sexual and relational um, health. It's so intrinsic to who people are and their well-being that we don't have an excuse not to think of it as part of our our day-to-day -day business. And particularly when you talk about sexual pleasure, talking about sexual pleasure with service users or even your partners opens up so many conversations because if you ta start talking about what feels good and identifying different parts of the body, people can start to say, oh, I didn't actually like it when that person touched me there. I feel a bit weird about that. Then you can start to talk about consent and it builds up this much bigger knowledge about your bodies, how you enjoy sex and also ways to keep yourself safe. I think, you, I think you're right. And um, it, there's, a, there's a question in the, the, the Q&A, sorry, Greg, um, who about um, uh, domestic violence and what, what, what's not good. And unless actually you teach people what healthy looks like and what normal looks like and give people the, the, the tools to articulate what they like and what they don't like and what, what, what feels uncomfortable, actually that makes all of these conversations really difficult. Because if we aren't helping people to articulate when something isn't right, and what they do want, then we're always going to be on that kind of back foot in terms of supporting people to be able to express what they want sexually, to express what feels good in their relationships, um, to, to express what feels good in, in every day. Going back to that mental health conversation, if we don't know how to articulate where we're at, then we're never going to be able to reach all of the people um, or, or reach out for the help that we, we want to. I think the, the question about domestic violence in the chat has been quite an interesting one, actually, um, especially given that there's such a dearth of services that can provide support for men who've experienced domestic violence. Um, and obviously, that going, going to get support doesn't necessarily also mean reporting the abuse, um, especially if you don't feel if you're in a population who might be oppressed by the police or likely to have a really negative experience with the police um, there's you know there's a lot of different barriers um, going on and so I think yeah having having safe spaces to be supported uh, to escape domestic violence is like for me a priority um, yeah I can't remember I think obviously that affects the mental health of people but I can't remember where the original question had gone <laughs> Yeah, I think you're completely right in terms of domestic violence and um, intimate partner violences. There aren't many services set up across Scotland for gay and bisexual men. And the other side is we don't actually know a lot about IPV for gay and bisexual men because all of our definitions are built on opposite sex couples. So we don't really know what the picture is for same sex couples and how that differs. We know different information about um, domestic violence in terms of LGBT populations, but that's also an England and Scotland comparison where the laws on domestic violence are different and include familial abuse as well. So I think in Scotland, there's a real need to look at what's going on for the men in our community and what domestic violence and intimate partner violence actually means for our community here to help us identify it, but also prevent future. I think uh, just kind of pulling on two of these questions, which probably relate more broadly to sexual health testing than specifically HIV testing. Um, but one of the questions that had come in was that all health boards in Scotland are struggling to engage young people in sexual health services, which I, I confess I didn't actually know. And, and what can be done to support and encourage young GBMSM MSM to access clinical services or support? the elder gays we need to take the young ones under our wing um and and and, and lead them in the right direction um i think so, it, it comes back to that education conversation and actually this being part of um uh education right from from a young age is that actually yeah i know i talked about moving into the the a, a wider conversation about public health which is important but actually if we know these populations are at higher risk or um that this the specific risks, then that conversation needs to be part of curriculum. That needs to be taught to, to people at a, a young age that actually this is really important. It's part of your um, health and well-being. I mean, I was much older than I should have been when I, you know, you find out that actually 
this proportion of people with um, LGBT plus identities will have worse mental health or more likely to be X, Y, or Z. Um, we don't have those conversations with, with young people and it's not about scaring them. It's about equipping them with the skills and the knowledge that they need to be able to, to, to protect themselves from some of that. So I think education um, in mainstream schools is, is hugely important. And I think also it's worth asking the community and particularly the young people why it is that they don't want to interact with the service. That's the only way you're going to know how you can actually engage them. Ask them what is it concerning? Is it possible like bullying in school? Is it the fact that names get around quite quickly? Is it even the stigma of being in a sexual health clinic that people are worried about? But until you ask them, you'll never, never actually know. And until you involve them in future development of resources or services, you're not really designing it with them in mind. And the other question that was kind of broadly related to the topic was that um, while sexual health services are offering reduced testing, mainly for people with symptoms, and this is during the current pandemic, what are the testing opportunities available for those unable to attend clinics? And um, Christopher has already touched on at-home HIV tests. But I think more just generally, do we need to be aware that by making testing unavailable, unless you're symptomatic, it could be leading to long term negative attitudes towards testing? I would say I think, um, yeah, there is a concern that people will start to lose faith in sexual health testing if they can't access it. There is currently plans and ways of reopening specifically for people who are really high risk around the sex they have, even if they are um, asymptomatic. But I think because the sexual health services kind of went into a shock at the start of the pandemic, things are slowly opening now, but it's to make people aware that the services will be there and that there are other opportunities of testing such as HIV self-test that you can order your own and things like that. But the main thing is ask your local clinic because I'll have the most up-to-date information and just be aware that services are there and they are coming, but it's just a slow teething process at the moment. Okay, um, if that's the end of the comments on that question, I might take the opportunity for um, five, 10 minute comfort break. So come back at 15.50. Um, and uh, thanks very much everyone for your questions so far if you can get thinking of any more in the uh, break and we'll resume at 10 to 4.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, thanks very much for our panelists for their contributions so far. Um, moving on, uh, the next question uh, that we were looking at, and it actually ties in with one of the questions that's come in on the Q&A function. Um, how have the lives of those living with HIV changed in recent years and what still needs to be done? And a question from the attendee today um, related specifically to stigma, um, which hopefully we will cover as part of that. Do you want me to go first? So um, I think there's been a massive load of changes for people living with HIV. We've seen much more wider reaching media campaigns. We've seen the advent of PrEP. We've seen U equals U as well. So we're having all these messages keeping HIV into like the community conscious. The good thing about U equals U is that message is getting out there. And I ask anyone after this call, during this call, whenever you get the chance to tell someone about U equals U, because it's going to be a massive, massive thing with reducing stigma that people living with HIV face. But also I think PrEP is part of that because along with treatment and prevention, PrEP puts the actual ownership over HIV prevention on the HIV negative person, which means that they have a part to play in reducing infections as well. So it becomes about a much wider conversation about the community effort. And um, I think there's still a long way to go. It's good to see, particularly on World AIDS Day, you see so much messaging out about HIV and about how with the effective treatment, people can live long and happy, healthy lives. And that's amazing. But it's also to see that through social media, you can also see people making ill-informed comments or negative comments that need to be challenged and addressed. And I think the only way we're going to do that is through education. And particularly if we're thinking about our understanding of HIV or the treatment, we have to acknowledge that we wouldn't be at the stage if it weren't for those who were fighting for it for all these years to have our voices heard. And it's essential for all future years that GBMSM communities continue to be at the heart of elimination strategies going forward, because um, we still carry a significant burden of HIV transmission in Scotland. But there's been a lot of medical changes and social changes, but I think still far to go. <laughs> I think just uh, picking up quickly on one of the points you made there, I think it's, it's all of our duties to call out uh, those comments that are very prevalent within the community and particularly within GBMSM uh, where there, there is an obvious stigma attached to it and the, the one that immediately swings to mind and the one that I always call people out on is the use of the word clean when they mean to refer to, the, to negative or to STI free um, and firstly you're only ever as STI free or negative as your last test um, but more than that the, the, the word clean obviously attaches a stigma and a shame that if you're not clean you're dirty um, and that it, it, ties into all kinds of things about your, your, your relationship with sex, your relationship to sexual health. Um, but at any opportunity where I, you see that word used, I cannot, I just physically cannot let that lie. And, and whenever, that's, that's the, the sort of obvious example, the one that comes up most commonly, but whenever I see those comments being made, I do feel a, a really intense duty to, to try and educate the person I'm dealing with. And if nothing else, if the person who I'm dealing with doesn't take much away except a, a stinger in the ear um, and that's the end of our interaction, then at least I've learned that that's a person that I don't really want to deal with anyway. Um, so, yeah. I think there's a couple of things in there about actually having these conversations out with the community of um, LGBT plus people, but also internally, because you, you we, we've all got a friend or we all know of someone who is HIV positive and that might appear on a profile on, to, on, a, on a dating app and then they've immediately had people choose decide that they, they're going to not engage with them or, or throw abuse at them online um, so it, it's 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 a conversation that you know that you equal to you message needs to be had with the general population um, and people who, who aren't queer who don't know queer people who aren't in that um, world but also we need to cha really challenge some of the stigma that exists um, inside the LGBT plus community, uh, because it because it's definitely there. And um, one of the things that's been on my mind recently a lot actually is is forgetting where 
where we were and where we've come from. Um, and one of the one of the many things that bothers me about um, <laughs> COVID is is this all, all all the narrative around this being this this once in a lifetime pandemic that we've never experienced and isn't it terrible? Um, and when the news of the COVID vaccine broke, I kind of thought, see if all these this much work and effort had gone into um, fighting HIV and AIDS in the, the late 80s, 90s, would it be a problem now? Or, or would we have kind of found a vaccine in, in 1992 um, and it would have been wonderful? Um, because it's the, the, the narrative of this being, of COVID being this pandemic that we've never experienced before, erases the, 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 the fight against HIV and AIDS and erases the lives of people of, that were lost to um, or, or irrevocably changed um, in that time, uh, I think, uh, and I think it's something that we need to be as 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 people who have a voice to say. Actually, guys, remember this happened. Um, this is still happening. So, so can you keep that in mind, please, before you you, you completely forget that it entirely happened. Yeah, I can only, I can only agree. Like one of the, I went to see Juno Roche um, speak before all of this, all of this broke out, and. Um, they said, like, if only, I, I hope that the people who are fearing this pandemic now feel an ounce of what we felt in the 80s. Like, just just a tiny bit. Um, yeah, and obviously the, there was a, government problems back then, but so much worse than they, were, they are now, where people were just being ignored when they were dying. Um, but anyway, uh, one of the things I wanted to mention about like the lives of hate people with HIV now um, is the book Disclosures, um, published by HIV Scotland um, in partnership with uh, Stu Drubar Press. But uh, there was a book about positive stories behind um, just by people living with or affected by HIV. And to have a book like that, I think it just means a lot. Like to have people saying like, this is just what it's like, like this is positive stories about my life, nothing about the, like, you know, the tombstone and the death and stuff, like just, this is this is what it's like. Um, yeah, I think that this, I think it will come, come on to mentioning about like prep uptake and stuff, but, but prep in general is just like a fantastic thing. I remember reading about the partner study at uni and I still am surprised that U equals U is not common knowledge but it's really not and we need to be talking about this like to your cis pals and het pals like they don't know <laughs> they don't know this is a thing now um so yeah i mean from personal experience that's true i mean I remember having conversations with colleagues about prep and they were shocked you know uh, and, and shocked that you can live a normal life with hiv and what did you think happened do you think it went away or that we found some way of stopping getting it i mean just it's baffling that there's there's such a lack of interest, I think, even just even, even knowing that effective treatments are out there, and um, because this is not something that affected people's lives. And again, it's that sort of duty to, when appropriate, to educate people about that by having that conversation. And I think as well, like if you think back to the whole, um, I think Oliver mentioned it in the Tombstone campaign, if the government spent the equivalent money now on a similar campaign about U equals U, we would not be having this discussion. <laughs> okay, we've just got to review the question to see if there was anything that sort of tied into uh, this discussion. I'm not sure, we'll try and pick up what we have uh, time for at the end. Um, the next question, and one that I'm particularly interested to hear about, is um, what needs to change to improve the lives of trans men in the community? Shall I take this one? <laughs> the token trans? Um, no, nah, I think there's some, like, one of one of the ones I want to talk about with this point is, like, there's many things, but... Um, but prep uptake among trans people has been so low. I think in the between 2017 and 2019 in Scotland, it's 0.5% has been trans people. And although we don't have census statistics of how many trans people there are, there's definitely more than the 17 that took prep, or I think it was around that number um, that decided to go on to prep. Um, and it just like, 
we 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 deserve better. We deserve better media. We deserve better. Sorry about the dog. Um, <laughs> we deserve better. Yeah, like we deserve to be included. Like I think the what I wanted to kind of get across was that if you think of a gay man, it doesn't. I want it to not be a cis man that you think of. I want it to be a cis or a trans man. Like you know, we we exist just as much as like everyone else and um, deserve targeted media and, and clinical support for HIV care as well as um, HIV prevention. Um, yeah, I think that's one big one. Does anyone else have any thoughts and I'll chip in? I think this is some of the stuff that we've we've touched on already that, um, you know, we kind of, we, we, we put ourselves forward as a LGBT plus community, um, but how often does, you know, a, a part of that, acronym get left behind or forgotten about and you only have to look at um this week where um another uh another group hosted a, a webinar um which was uh entirely trans exclusive and you just kind of think we got where we are but because of uh trans siblings and actually if we're not going to return the favor and, and and support people then there's something seriously wrong with us um and we need to be able to to, to challenge people with that and 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 make sure that actually what we're doing doesn't just let's let's be perfectly honest um do well for the, for the g and then secondly the l and then maybe somewhere down the line everybody else um we can't rest on our laurels just because things are, are better for us when the rest of this community that we we claim to be a part of um things are still pretty tough at times I think that's completely right. We do need to support the whole community in that sense. And that was one of the main things when Oliver and I were working on the trans men content update, we were like, we want the website to actually be reflected of the community, not parts of the community, like the community in its entirety. And that's also true of other elements of the LGBT in terms of uh, bisexual identities can always be missed over. And that's what another group that we need to shout about and talk about their experiences as well. And I think a big part of that is it's hard to even get services to record sexuality, but even recording gender identity as well, because if you don't record our populations, you won't have data to help us. So it's about that kind of awareness and training for services to make sure that they're equipped to actually support the community correctly and, and in the correct language and simple things. But um, I think one thing from the research Oliver was involved in the needs to be care throughout was actually um, participants said it would be helpful for trans people to be involved in sexual health clinics, but not in all roles. It can even be not in clinical roles as well, just in terms of support and advocacy is just such a big change for them. So I think as SX prides ourselves on being we're led by gay and bisexual men, like who are actually our staff, that needs to be true in loads of different reaches and services as well. So you have that peer support element and you have that lived experience as well. So I think, yeah, awareness and actual identifying the community is really key. And one of the questions that has come in to tie in into this is where can these places, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about sexual health or general um, NHS services, um, access resources to help them become more inclusive? I think um, Chris answered that question when we were talking about young people. You, you speak to the communities, you speak to the people who have the lived experience, who, who understand what it's like to be this kind of marginalized, marginalized community and say, actually, what are we doing that's, that's wrong? Um, or what could we do better to, to make this a more welcome and inclusive place for you? Um, it's, it's so much of it already exists. So much of the, the evidence already exists, so much of the information already exists, but services or, 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 or the people within services choose maybe not to engage with that um, evidence, or if I'm being kinder, don't know they need to engage with that evidence, um, but it's there. And if it's not there, then we need to ask the people who it's not inclusive for, because otherwise we, we, we just put on what we think is, is the right answer. And that's probably gonna come from a position of privilege. 
I think uh, particularly for trans people, the, the work that, that Oliver has done uh, in relation to this is excellent. I really do mean it when I say it was a very good read. Um, and I think I can hopefully get the link to that put up in the uh, the chat function. But uh, for anybody who is looking for a little bit more information about that, then I would definitely encourage that, uh, that you take the time to read that. I would also take the opportunity to plug the SX website. <laughs> have to do it. But um, yeah, I think particularly Sam hit the nail on the head in talking about people's experiences and that's what the website was made out of was community consultation and making sure that we had the relevant information for people's needs and desires so it is born out of community and it is all encompassing in terms of mental health good sex relationships chem sex information staying safe but also has things like a risk tool which can talk you through different sex acts in a really sex positive way so i think We've spent a lot of time and energy making sure that it was fit for the community. So it's there, use it. It has downloadable resources. And if you need anything more, you can always talk to us. Okay, um, I might move on to the um, next and final of the, the questions that we'd prepared in advance of today. Um, and that is, how are the experiences of men living in remote and rural communities different to those in the cities? touched partly on on this in response to some of the questions earlier, but um, uh, I mean, I would be interested to know what you think. Do you want me to start, Sam? <laughs> so um, because Essex is Scotland wide, we have services in Edinburgh, the Lothians, but we also have services in Forth Valley, but also Highland and Argyll and Butte. So we know a lot about the different experiences of men living in those communities. and. There is a question about access and visibility and some sexual health services are easy to access and support as well. But um, I think one thing to point to was the Equality Network actually did an LGBT rural report that showed that um, LGBT populations in rural areas were more likely to have mental health issues and that related to prejudice and minority stress in these areas. But also that LGBT people living in rural areas in Scotland were 81% more likely to experience prejudice or discrimination in their communities. And of course, I think COVID has exacerbated this in a sense in terms of feelings of isolation in terms of the different communities that people are placed. But again, social media and kind of the online resources may have mitigated some of these issues and made potentially them more viewable and settled the playing field in that sense. But there's something to be said about knowing that these services exist in your area, knowing that you have someone to speak to. So the live chat function that we have on the SX website is heavily used. And I think that could also be a solution to kind of access to services and giving information. But there can be the case where in their local area, there isn't actually think anything set up for them or there isn't any LGBT things in their area. So I think isolation is a big risk for men who live in rural or remote communities. I think this 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 is probably mentioned earlier slightly with the when we talked about the digitalization of stuff is that that's probably done a lot to to support people who live in remote and rural areas because it, it does mean that you can you can tap into the, the the same same things or similar things that people who live in the bustling metropolis of of Edinburgh um, can do on a on a regular basis. But I I, I think it. I can't speak from experience because I, I don't have that that lived experience. But I know for me, and I've talked about this earlier already, kind of being around other um, queer people and having that sense of shared identity and, and shared experience and shared community does absolutely wonderful things for me. I was, I was talking to a friend recently who um, recently joined um, the rugby club that I'm part of. Um, and they mentioned that when one of the first times they came up, um, I'd made a stupid drag race joke and everyone got it. And everyone, he was just like, oh, okay, these people all get my references and I don't have to explain um, a comment I make or a joke I make. So to have, to not have that would be uh, a, a huge loss to me. So I can only um, put in my, my own feelings on other people that similar things must be experienced by people who live in, in rural communities, not having access to that community on their doorstep. Yeah, I think it's, uh, again, not really speaking from a position of lived experience, having grown up just in Aberdeenshire uh, and, and spending most of my time in the city. Um, it's, 
it is just about finding community and uh, it, it can actually apply to you I think sometimes whether you live in cities or not um, if you don't if you can't find people through clubs or shared interests um, then it, it, and, and you can't find those people who reflect back to you what you put out to them then it's, it, it can be it must be very difficult and it must be very isolating and hopefully um, the, the online resources social media online communities and things like this now where people can connect over distances that they didn't previously think was possible and um, could hopefully try and close some of that isolation for people because it must be pretty difficult. I think as well there's a number of barriers that come from it's in a city kind of structure it's very easy to become anonymous if you want to be but in a kind of rural setting where you know like your neighbor or you know your nurse hell no, are you going to go for a sexual health test if your nurse knows your mom? <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So it's kind of these issues, are, again, with, of course, anywhere in Scotland, the NHS is bound by the same confidentiality laws, but that doesn't stop the cogs in your head worrying and thinking, what if someone was just to mention that they saw me dropping into the clinic? So I think there's whole barriers there around access and maybe, who knows, we could have a HIV vending machine in Highland <laughs> where people could pick up their tests. But it's of thinking about more nuanced ways of getting out um, information and services to people because the, the want and the need is there. Yeah, I think okay. I can... so, Sorry, on you go. Okay, I was, I was going to just comment on kind of the, the, the health experience of people in rural, rural communities must be very difficult simply because a lot of the health problems that might be faced by GBMSN, for example, are not served by um, you're, or are not known to be served by your local communities. You, you won't have as effective as a, a sexual health treatment if you have to go through your, your GP rather than specialist services. Um, and also they're not used to dealing with some of the problems that affect gay, gay and bisexual men have sex with men because things like chemsex, for example, you know, you, you're, you come up here on a, on, a, on a come down after having a weekend in London where you've gone from your rural community and you present in your GP um, with what somebody in London would instantly recognize and try and point you in, in the direction of services of your GP in, in the Highlands is not going to know what that is and is very likely to miss it just simply because the education and the knowledge and the experience isn't there. I think I think you're completely right and I think that the kind of the the experiences of, of, of healthcare staff in managing something like that would be limited um, so we need to make sure that things like the SX website um, where where people can get in touch with resources that they need. Um, I wasn't planning to say that, I promise. Um, but that, 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 that they're there and people are aware of them and that we, we share this information. I think the, the, the thing that struck me was we've talked about kind of this digital world now as kind of leveling the playing field. And it's important that we don't forget about those people who live in Highland and Island um, and other remote and rural, rural areas, because actually it doesn't need to be a million miles away if you're reliant on public transport west lothian can be remote and rural if if you don't have that access to to, to your own transport or, or reliable public transport you don't have to be that far out before it becomes isolating but what we what we need not to happen is these restrictions to be lifted a vaccine to be administered for covid and then all of a sudden we forget about streaming events about access for disabled people about access for people who live uh, with um, uh, with kind of the city where they can just pop down to to, to the bottom of Broughton Street and come into to Essex um, Waverley Care offices for the screening to sit in on a panel any of these things we need to make sure we don't forget about them. Okay, um, well that brings us to the end of the, the formally scripted questions and, and we're now going to try and answer some of the things that have come up today. So you might forgive us if we've not had the time to think about the questions in as much detail. Um, I'll try and probably just work through these um, in the order that they've come in. Um, and the first one there is um, one that we've already touched on about interpersonal domestic violences um, and in particular asking how do we challenge toxic masculinity and encourage GBMSM to come forward to report abuse and to get support. Well, um, I think I said earlier on is um, actually we need first the tools to be able to identify how IPV and domestic violence is different for GBMSM. 
but it's also making sure that we provide a kind of hospitable environment that comes from a lack of judgment and also a lack of stigma when dealing with these cases. But I think when it comes to the idea of challenging toxic masculinity, that's a much bigger fish. And I'm trying to think of different ways that you do that when that's a much more wide thing. But I think that's around representation and visibility as well about different versions of masculinity and what masculinity means to different people. Because while it can be toxic for some, it can be really affirming and really beneficial to others. So I think it's thinking about not toxic masculinity, masculinity in general, but I think it's thinking about engaging your community and increasing your representation so people know that you are an open and kind of accepting service. I don't know what other people think about that. I think there's, um, there's also, I mean, if we think about reasons why someone might not come forward and report abuse, um, toxic masculinity and like feeling emasculated might be one, but also not feeling like feeling like it was your fault, which is mm. what abuse does to a person. And so like making it clear that that's like the messaging that's often directed at women can be directed at men and say, look, if you feel like this person is making you feel like this or, um, or if you're having these kind of things happening in your relationship, then you should speak to somebody and that's not what a healthy relationship is and that that might be called abuse um and and yeah like sharing the information but targeted at the populations that we need to target it like men who have sex with men and um yeah i think as like like i've said before having support supportive spaces that are dedicated to men who have experienced violence like that um is key as well because men are often overlooked in this particular category um and especially in terms of like defunding of charities that support like there's been a number over the years in edinburgh and i could think generally nationally there's been quite a lot of just redirecting of funds um which has been really sad to see like less and less support services available um yeah <laughs> Okay, and one of the, the next questions um, is maybe a difficult one to answer, and it relates to some of the things we've touched on um, and perhaps we haven't really addressed in particular is, um, could you discuss possibly some of the experience that bisexual men who are living with HIV specifically face, such as when they're disclosing their status, when sleeping with heterosexual women, or biphobia, etc. I think there's probably a, a lot to be said about um, bisexual people and stigma um, generally, but um, particularly in relation to HIV stigma when they are then sleeping with uh, opposite sex partners who perhaps don't have that same level of education. I think um, there, I could go away and look at this and possibly come back to the person correctly on this as well, but there's not that much dedicated research to the experiences of bisexual people in relation to HIV. They very much clumped into MSM information, which is a massive issue because it effectively causes bioerasure and you don't really know the specifics or the nuanced issues going on in that community. But I think one thing that's come up quite a bit is the fact that our sexual health education is very targeted in schools, well, previously targeted for women around pregnancy and men around condom use, but doesn't actually talk about same sex couples. And there's quite a lot of stigma that arises from that, particularly when we thought earlier about who's actually at risk of HIV. People think, oh, it's only men who have sex with men at risk of HIV. Therefore, if this person is bisexual, they're bringing that risk to our community, which is completely unfair. And I think, yeah, it's one of those things that there's not enough information specifically about the sex that bisexual people have in relation to risk for me to comment at the moment. Yeah, I think it's probably just something that, that needs to be um, kind of considered specifically um, for, the, for the people uh, who are affected. And, and like we all said earlier today, you, you listen to them first um, before you try and, and address the problem on their behalf. 
Um, okay, the, the next question um, is quite a good one. If we wish to normalise accessing sexual health services, uh, then do the laws around GUM secrecy need to change? Um, and I'll confess, despite being a lawyer, I don't know anything about public health law, and so I don't know anything about uh, GUM secrecy and what that might be. Does anyone have any knowledge about that? I don't know if it for definite, but it might be around the um, separation of... Like a Fraser may be able to correct me, but um, around the separation of like notes and using completely different systems between your GP and your sexual health clinic. Chris, do you know if that's what Fraser? I'm, I'm assuming that's what that's getting at in terms of the Nash yeah. system. Yeah. There's basically um, for anyone who's not like intricately aware of like NHS databases, um, they have. So there's a, there's a system for your GP notes, a system for your hospital notes. They are separate, so the hospital people write to your GP, but there's also a whole separate system for your um, sexual health service notes. And I think historically that's been because people didn't want to see their family doctor about their sex life. Um, and so I would say that potentially that could like normalizing accessing sexual health services by integrating notes is helpful, but also it could definitely mean that people wouldn't, might be less inclined to access their sexual health service. I know for that this actually came up a lot in the trans research that we did um, in terms of a sexual health center and the gender clinic, for some reason, they're on the same system. And, um, and so the gender clinicians can also read about what you've seen a sexual health clinic for, um, which a lot of people were very uncomfortable about because historically gender clinicians judge trans people on what they do sexually. Um, and yeah, there's, there's essentially there's lots of little archaic systems within the NHS. It's not always so well designed. And, um, and there's a lot of work to be done um, in terms of like, what would actually be the best system for a lot of people and where could you keep some things confidential and other things um, yeah more kind of openly available I think I struggle with this one um, a little bit in the in the keeping them separate because I was like, like I'm a nurse by background um, and NHS systems not speaking to each other is one of the biggest pains um, in my entire professional career. Um, when your GP doesn't speak to the specialist services, which doesn't speak to something, and then some of your internal systems don't speak to each other. Um, and everyone's life would be so much easier if things did just speak to each other. Um, I do see the, the kind of the issue with trying to manage different parts of your life separately. And some of the stuff we talked about in remote and rural um, areas where you might not want the local nurse who's your mum's best pal to know about your sexual history or your, your, your sexual health. But I do think um, from, a, from a healthcare perspective, when we, when we work with people and when we, when we work with patients and when we treat patients, we aim to work with people from a place of um, holism. We, we want to look at the entire person. And some of this comes down to normalization of sexual health as part of someone's normal function, as how they engage with the world, how they um, engage with other people, because it has an impact on the rest of their, their health and well-being because no one condition or, or no one behavior comes all by itself so i do think there's probably something that we need to do at a kind of as a training and education level for healthcare workers to, to normalize um sexual activity to normalize uh, asking people questions about their sexual health because i know there's people who i've worked with who there was there's no chance that i would feel comfortable having a conversation with them about sexual health and certainly not sexual activity that might then lead to other questions to do with my sexual health. Not a chance, no way in hell. So unless we're actually preparing people for those conversations to be um, okay and feel comfortable, then the merging of systems and being open about our, our sexual identities, our, our gender identities, our sexual health across systems is gonna be really, really difficult. And I think would lead to disengagement from services. I just want to add on top of that as well. I think there's a there's a potentially a space for GPs to be a bit more sexual health aware and a bit more encouraging of having those open conversations about sexual health rather than it being 
um, the responsibility of like, oh, go and see your sexual health clinic about that, because they do have the capacity to do tests. And um, I think HIV Scotland had done a, a bunch of research on um, GPs being aware of HIV symptoms. And there was a shockingly low amount of GPs who would have asked given quite clear presentations of like later stage HIV that they might have said, have you, when was your last HIV test? Um, so I think there's education to be done in like GP surgeries about making people comfortable and perhaps a, like a rethinking of how, um, how people could say like, actually I can just see my GP about this. I might feel more comfortable seeing my GP or a nurse I'm familiar with rather than a random sexual health clinic. And then um, encouraging a bit more of like you can see your family doctor for all things. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and the, the next question that's come in is how can authorities like Police Scotland and the councils work with GBMSM or LGBTQ plus communities to encourage hate crime reporting? I'm happy to chat about this one. Oh, yeah. Go, okay, Chris. Um, I think the whole process needs to be a bit better. Um, generally, hate crime reporting, there's often like little accountability. Um, like in my experience personally of hate crime reporting, it's generally been very frustrating, very much the onus being on um, you explaining why there's something would have been hateful. Um, so potentially explaining the basics of transphobia and it just, it can end up being kind of traumatic to bother even going down that route and I think the I know there's some new um hate crime laws coming out so I don't haven't read a lot about it so I don't want to speak on that but um yeah I think that there's there's generally like the process needs to be a bit more user friendly <laughs> um it just ends up being really arduous and really like there's one time where I had to I reported and you know reported some like transphobic graffiti and um and then was sent around the houses trying to call the council to get it removed and I'm like um I'm the person who has experienced the the like hateful incident of people writing abusive stuff about like my minority and now you're asking me to like do your groundwork to clear it up like this is ridiculous um so yeah I think there just needs to be a like a change <laughs> in various procedures. <laughs> yeah, you kind of feel like if you were speaking to somebody who was from a minority, they wouldn't have had that same um, uh, immediate reaction of, well, you tell me why that's wrong. Um, Absolutely. It would be, it would have been better to have somebody go like, yeah, I appreciate this is awful. Like, we'll do everything we can to make that right. Um, definitely. Yeah, I think that goes straight back to the point earlier about just having your experiences validated and your rights recognized are so important to making you feel empowered to actually communicate or report something going wrong. But I think Police Scotland have done well in terms of like appointing LGBT liaison officers in different areas of the country. I think that's been a great step. They've done good campaigns as well, but I think it's actually about on the ground work and working directly with the communities and um, just recognizing their concerns legitimately and not kind of pushing them off or pushing them aside. I've only heard like very vague references to that recently, but long may it continue to improve. <laughs> I think I think the police do, I mean, the police in particular, do recognise that they don't get this right, um, and that they they have tried. Um, there are initiatives. It's maybe slow progress. I I hope that progress is being made. Um, I'm in the fortunate position where I haven't had to report a hate crime so I, I, or any crime for that matter. And I couldn't really kind of comment on the, the approach taken in one instance or another. Um, but I, I, I know that Police Scotland are actively working on engaging with minority communities. Um, and it's just that piece on, on, on education uh, generally um, and, and getting people from minorities, any minority into the police. I think there's also something to be said for like no one's going to report to a body who they think they're going to be like abused by um so I know a number of people who have had bad experiences of reporting black people women like trans people and they've just said I'm never doing that again what was the point like that was worse than if I just let it go 
Um, so I think that there's a building of trust between like big authorities and bodies like the police or the councils. And, um, and that takes a long time to build that kind of um, trust. But also I think that there's, there's very much room for like redesigning services that are gonna like, you know, you can't, yeah, just the, I'm gonna go into like a cab or something. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, yeah. I think you made a good point about trust though, because it is about building trust and capacity within the community because rather than treating the people who are reporting as the fount of knowledge, actually work with the communities such as like SX or Scottish Trans Alliance who are there to provide information and don't expect the people you're supporting to be part of the information you should be have an awareness of like the different ways that gay men form relationships or the fact that some men might cruise and that's just part of their life and rather than treating it as something that's opposite to how society functions and then something to be dealt with actually learn how communities differ and use your community organizations to learn that rather than them yeah, I, I do actually remember reading about the kind of the police Scotland approach um, and specifically about cruising on, on Cotton Hill. And they, 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 there was a statement where it was, like, we have been policing people on that hill for a hundred years. Maybe it is time for a different approach. And you feel like if they were able to take that different approach to understanding that these aren't these are people's personal lives. This is not what we are here to police. We are here to support them because they are people. And that's all we need to know. Um, yeah, I think that if those kind of that attitude could change on a, on a much, much wider basis, then um, maybe people would feel more supported by police. So the, the next question that came in um, is that the TIE um, Time for Inclusive Education campaign has seen the introduction of LGBT plus learning in all curriculum areas in Scottish schools, which is awesome. What opportunities are there for adults, however, to continue their learning about sex and relationships within the GBMSM community? And I, I mean, I'll be honest, um, obviously there are a lot of services that, that Waverly Care and SX can use. Um, I'm not sure that there, there are many uh, from my own perspective, um, opportunities for education. Um, but one of the most important opportunities for education for me that I've found is um, within my community. Um, again, feeling that responsibility of, as Sam might have uh, called us earlier, uh, elder gaze, and <laughs> your, your duty to help other people um, to, to be able to be honest about sex, sexual health, sexual relationships, um, and other aspects of our community. Um, I, I feel that that is a responsibility um, of being a, an older gay man, not older, older, but older than some, uh, and, and taking the opportunity for those people who have those questions to pass that down, because that then builds community as well. I think, I, uh, oh, go ahead, Sam. No, I'll have you first. I was gonna say the resources that I found have generally um, kind of subcultural sub or within books. Uh, so zines quite a lot of the time. I know Meg John Barker has uh, quite a lot of resources zines and such to um, educate on healthy relationships and like consent and various other things. And they've, they've produced some um, like graphic novels um, around like queer sex and guides. And I think there's quite a number of authors um, and like discussing that sort of thing and like how healthy relationships might occur um, just in terms of like general education. I've got one book, really great one. I'm going to grab it. Um, <laughs> called uh, Cruising, which I found very educational in terms of like it's it, the tagline says an intimate history of a radical pastime, and I found that really interesting as a kind of fresh gay dude um, who only started identifying as a gay man a couple of years back um, to learn a bit more about my history and kind of the history of people like me who have, and like why people might cruise and um, understanding a bit more about that particular activity and its political and like radical roots um, as and like in spaces where it was not legal to connect or meet with gay men, then you could, that everyone was pushed into this outside space and that's where cruising was born. Um, and how cruising kind of has developed over time. That was really interesting for me. I think there's a lot of like, just like, go to your local queer bookshop. Um, there's definitely like resources there to start exploring. 
and yeah. I think um, as well as kind of the the, the written word, um, stories are so important and people's stories are so important and we can learn so much from sharing those stories and collecting those stories um, and and however we disseminate them there's there's learning in them and I think things like this are absolutely incredible where you can you can just drop in um, and and spend a couple of hours chatting because I, I you know sitting here as a panelist um, and there's stuff that I've taken notes of now that I need to go away and look up uh, maybe that cruising book and then I'll stop thinking of cruising as a tv show that stars Jay McDonald kind of there's all these there's all these 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 things that we can tap into. I think the big problem for, um, not problem, that's the wrong word, the, 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 the stumbling block with that, is that at the moment we have to actively look for them. Um, and that it's, it's the people who are already interested that are gonna go and look for them, who are gonna try and develop their knowledge. And, and some of that education that we need to do is outside of those people. Um, and it needs to be education, which transforms attitudes and values and thoughts rather than training which says oh i i shouldn't say the f word because that's not very nice um so it, it's it's more meaningful uh, and how we do that is is a much more much more difficult thing i think and of course i'm going to plug the essex scotland website obviously um but yeah fantastic resource for so much different information but also talking about personal stories and experiences we have a series of podcasts about men's relationship to alcohol so i think that's really key to like look into actually how people have dealt with um, challenges in their sex life and their relationships in relationship to alcohol. And um, I think particularly Essex comes from a community led area. So we always believe that men's stories and men's experiences need to be at the heart of what we do. And that's going to be at the, the heart of people's education and those kind of better understandings or more nuanced understandings of the experiences of gay and bisexual men in relationships and sex. There's a there's an amazing podcast that I've um, that I wouldn't can't stop recommending to people. Uh, it's called The Logbooks, um, and it's an exploration of um, LGBT plus life across the UK um, from kind of I think it starts in kind of 1960s um, and then moves on from there. And it's all based on people's stories and experiences. The, yeah, the episodes are pretty short, kind of 30 minutes. So you know you can you can pop it on while you're doing the hoovering, um, and then by the time you're done, voila, you've you, you've learned something. I think that's exactly it. It's sharing those stories and or even just sharing the things that you're reading with people or listening to, because now that I've heard about that, I'm going to go and listen to it and then I'll learn something, hopefully pass that on to somebody too. So that, that can be a way for education to get out uh, when, when we're no longer in schools. And um, the, the good one for you, Sam, is the next question. Um, what can community groups such as sport clubs, community centres, etc., do to encourage people from stigmatised communities to get involved or to become less isolated? Uh, yeah, it almost feels like I wrote that myself. Um, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot that we can do. Um, and it, it, it starts, again, with what people can see. Um, so we need people to know that this is a welcoming environment and, and the way we do that is, is by what we, we produce, how we live our values of, as, as a club. Um, but I think there's things that we can do more proactively to stop people just looking at something and thinking that they can be part of it. And I think for, for us, um, we used to, um, when, when, when the world wasn't uh, riddled with COVID, um, used to go out to bars to recruit people. Um, and actually there's probably things within our our recruitment strategy that we need to consider to, to meet these stigmatized groups. Like actually, why aren't we going to, to uh, Scottish trans to, to bring in people or, or groups specifically for people of color to say, actually, this is a space that, that you're welcome to as well. Because I think kind of, if you, if you looked on the surface of it through our social media, we're a very white cis male club. So somebody might look at that and go, actually, am I welcome there? So there's, there's something that we need to do as a community group to actually go out to people and say, please come if you, if you want to, this is a, this is a space for, for everyone. Um, so it's, it's, I think community groups more widely, um, and I'm including, including us in that, need to be active in trying to, to, to bring in um, stigmatized and what we might call hard to reach groups 
rather than just expecting people to come to us, um, which on the surface might look like um, the kind of people who they haven't had positive experiences with previously. I think there's some difficulties in particular with sports clubs. Um, there's been some progress in terms of trans inclusion with Scottish athletics and the inclusion of non-binary people as a category in like the kind of licensing requirements. But, um, but then there's other news about rugby excluding trans women um, and just, yeah, there's still a fight going on um, in general with like, you can't take the the politics away from like all of these little spaces like a trans person is still experiencing oppression in other ways even within a like a community group as well as you know a black person a disabled person um so yeah i guess making sure that you're you can you can encourage people from stigmatized communities to get involved by decreasing those barriers and like thinking about the barriers they might be facing to access um, you know, for disabled people could just be, is the space accessible? Uh, is it too noisy? Are there like artificial lights? Are there stairs? You know, the, those things can make a real difference to someone who's autistic or someone who's using a wheelchair. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, think about what barriers are, what barriers these people might be facing as to why they're not turning up. Um, yeah. And I think that's some of the stuff I meant when I said that you have to live your values because we can all talk about being inclusive and we can all talk about, you know, we're, we're equal access, all this stuff. Um, but I, I, I think that the trans, um, the, 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 the banning of trans women here by World Rugby um, is obviously quite fresh in our mind. And one of the things that, that we did um, as an LGBT plus inclusive club was make our views known to world rugby through IGR, but then also to Scottish rugby um, through our links by saying, actually, guess what? Trans people are very welcome um, here and they will continue to be welcome here, um, both trans men and trans women. Um, and anyone who identifies in, in, in any other way that they may choose, they are welcome here. And I think it's important that as community groups, if we, if we tell ourselves and tell other people that we represent a community, that actually we stand up for that community even when it's it's more difficult to do so um, and we continue to live the values that we, we 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 propose i think for sport it's a particularly difficult one um because i can imagine that anyone who falls under um, the lgbt plus kind of umbrella has had a negative experience with sport at some point or another, whether it's uh, when I was young being called called a faggot when I was trying to play rugby, or uh, a, a woman who's been considered uh, masculine uh, as a derogatory term because they enjoy sport. And I, I think it can be really difficult to, to engage with that, really difficult. I know it took me kind of four years of thinking about joining the Thebans before I actually did. Um, and I was very pleasantly surprised when I did because kind of thinking about my experience, I'd been in Edinburgh for nine kind of years before I joined the Thebans, but it was then that I really found a community for myself, that actually I was then surrounded by um, gay and bisexual men, uh, trans men, and straight men who supported what we believe in and what we are working towards. And actually I was like, okay, so these are my people. And I felt more comfortable where I am. And I felt like I actually had a home in Edinburgh through being part of that community. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do to give that opportunity to other people. Not gonna lie, I still think about joining the Thebans. <laughs> uh, training's at half past six, I'll see you then. Simon's here and he wants to recruit you. I guess that's, that's me and the Thebans. <laughs> You know, that's the actual gay agenda, is to just bring more and more people into the Caledonian Thebans. Everybody play rugby, the, the actual gay agenda. <laughs> um, turning to the next question, uh, one we've kind of touched on a little bit. Um, do you think sex and relationships education needs to become mandatory in Scotland for it to truly become inclusive and not tokenistic in its approach? Seeing if Sam was going first, I could see him. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I think mute myself. Um, I do think it needs to be mandatory because I think you need to level the playing field in terms of what access people have to information and making sure that the LGBT bit is not skipped over in certain schools and that the actual bit of talk about pleasure and about contraception and prevention are talked about and that they're at least all covered and everyone gets the same education in that terms. I think that's really important for us to go forward on sexual health education. I think the longer that we don't make this kind of thing mandatory and meaningful, because that's that's the the, the 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 big thing as well is the is the meaningful, not just here's the information. It's how what what how, what does this mean? Um, until we do that, we just continue to build the structures that already exist, and we continue to feed into the the the, the experiences that people already have. And then what groups like um, SX have to do, and what we all have to do as queer people when we're kind of old enough to do it is unpick all that damage that was done to us by that being ignored or, or not being spoken about or just neglected. Um, to unpick all that and actually work out how how we do things well. Um, so until it, it, it comes in right from the beginning um, and people are actually prepared to, to teach it and encourage it, not encourage it, that's the wrong word, but uh, allow it to, to be. Um, encourage it sounded so section 28 didn't it um so like and, until that happens and it, it, it can happen in a meaningful way we're just going to fulfill that kind of self-fulfilling prop prophecy i think as well like in addition with sex and relationship stuff we're always going to be dealing with like the older generation the parents and convincing them at the same time as needing to educate like a younger folk and um and <laughs> I know good people working on um, like the kind of sex, sex and relationships education at the moment, um, and that it does, you know, focus on pleasure. But if you say I'm going to focus on sexual pleasure when I'm teaching young children, it sounds intimidating to a parent. To any parent, they're like, "No, what? Like, don't teach them that it's fun." But they, but it is, and it will be, and they need to know that that's okay. And you know that's fine. It's okay to have a have fun, but this is where the risks lie. This is where you need to be careful. This is the um, potential for a pregnancy. This is the potential for an STI. These are things you need to do about it. But go forth, have a good time. Like, but and if you focus on where where the pleasure is, you can focus on consent, and then and like build a whole kind of informed approach around like this is what I like. This is where I like to be touched. Sometimes that could just be, I like kissing or I like to hold someone's hand. And then they understand rather than sex being this, there's a penis in the vagina and that's where that happens. We all know that's not how sex is for everyone. Like, come on. But that's all we got told when we were kids. Like that's, that, that's where the like pregnancy and the risk thing is for like sex and relationships. So if we can focus on consent and pleasure, then it opens up a whole thing of like, oh, my butt gives me pleasure or like, oh, I like kissing or, oh, I like rimming. You know, there's all sorts of different things that people will be able to explore as they grow in an age appropriate way. But that like, you know, we need to convince this whole generation, like all of us need to be, because we've all got told this thing that was outdated back when we were told it. Um, you know, the, it's 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 this whole generation, like you're dealing with parents as well as like young people that um, you're trying to convince this, like, and it's a bit, it's an intricate web. <laughs> it's difficult, I appreciate, but like, I think, yeah, it does need to be mandatory and done well. Um, and then we might be able to, you know, deal with some of the stigmas around, uh, you know, slut shaming and stuff as well. And I think that's the good conversation around it is like, if we're going to talk about the negative aspects of sexual health, we have to be willing to talk about the good side of it as well, because I can't remember where I read this, but it was, which isn't helpful to bring up in a panel discussion, but um, it was a young people's group who genuinely thought that just by having sex, they would get an STI because that's all they'd been taught that sex equaled an infection. So they just assumed any time they had sex, they would get an STI and they just have to deal with that. So it's about having this kind of more holistic and well-rounded approach to sexual health and understanding that there are good parts and there are negative parts. Because if we stop saying this is sex and this is definitely not sex and kind of expand that saying, what is good sex for you? 
it actually opens up a bigger conversation about what's achievable for different populations, what is accessible, what do people actually want to engage in, rather than this whole scenario around there's kind of the first step where you do oral sex and then there's penetration and that's that. <laughs> it's much more expansive. Sex isn't that boring. It can be so much better. <laughs> boring can be nice too. So this is one of those things I'm taking notes on. I think if you can, you can just thinking of examples of how you can teach something in a, a way that focuses on pleasure that actually involves like safety. Um, how can you make a condom pleasurable? Like generally people are like, oh no, it feels bad. I don't like condoms. But like, if you can interact with that in a way that's like, oh, I like put it on in this way, or I like to put it on like that, or this is the kind of condom I like to use or like exploring different options. There are ways to teach like your safety in a framework of pleasure, which make it like, yeah, kind of, it'd be great if everyone did that. You think take the stigma out of sex so that it was, you know, it was like driving, you teach people to drive and the benefits of driving are well known, but then you teach people about the risks of driving. If you drive too fast or if you drive while drunk, then these bad things might happen. And it just, if it's just a simple function of somebody's life, which sex is for almost everyone, then, it doesn't have to be shameful or stigmatized and can just be taught as part of these are the good things, these are the bad things. Um, okay, um, almost, I think we might have time for everyone. Um, the, the last two questions, the first one is, um, it's, it's a very interesting question actually, and one that I've often thought about, um, and particularly in relation to queer spaces, and the, the, the need for younger people to access queer spaces when there aren't so many issues to being LGBT. Um, and it's going back a bit, they say, but do you think there's a lack of engagement with services due to increased visibility? As discussed, more young people are feeling more confident to be themselves, which is wonderful, due to increased visibility. But as such, they might not be engaging with GBMSM services because they don't necessarily feel the need to seek them out. And do you think that that could be a thing? It could be a thing. It could be a success of services being able to actually work with populations and being ready to actually understand the different nuances of those relationships and the different kind of aspects that person's identity brings to their sexual health. So that could be a thing. And also I hear that quite a bit in student populations, but then again, there does become a point of where is this access? Is it in these big cities where there's been more training with multiple services or in rural situations, people may need that specific GBMSM service to pick up because there hasn't been that level of educational knowledge. But I do think it is something that happens and is more of a success of training and kind of awareness campaigns that have been going on. I think it, I think it is an interesting idea that actually because things are becoming or because these 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 conversations are becoming more visible that people don't need to engage as much i'd, I'd, I'd like to see what the, the kind of evidence says about it um that's the academic in me wanting to see that see that see the data and the proof um that actually people's sexual health is being managed well um in this population by not accessing special services because if so fantastic because actually what we sh we should be aiming for if we're looking for um equality and equity in services is that actually I don't need to go to a specialist service to get this to get high quality treatment or high quality intervention for this thing I should be able to get that anywhere and everyone should be um, able to help um, so I, I'd like to see what the, the 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 data was in terms of people's health and how it's being managed if they're not using specialist services I think um, an interesting one was we did a, a survey relating to the alcohol harm work we do um, and it actually showed that men would prefer that kind of support in a GBMSM service because they would have a much more holistic understanding whereas you may go to a sexual health service and get a really good comprehensive sexual health service like service and um, then you are transferred across to a mental health one which isn't prepared for you so it hasn't got all those checks and balances in place so it really is about whether that service you've reached is trained and it may not be a whole holistic one so there is always a place for specialized services in these cases sometimes i, I wonder if there is a, just a, a question of 
people because they haven't had those experiences as queer people they haven't spoken with other queer people queer people about the services that they access when they need them whether that's mental health sexual health any kind of health or or otherwise maybe they just don't know that they're there and that they're for they're there for them it's a bit like sam was saying about the thebans you know going to places and saying we're the thebans and we're an inclusive rugby team and what that really means if we're a, a service for all of these people how do we let them know if they're not accessing those services or no or if they don't know other people who are accessing those services so it's again just about sharing the information within a community of this is where you go and you get your sexual health checks and this is where you can get your condoms and your lube and this is where you can get sexual health information if it's not just from your pal Okay, um, the last question then is uh, in terms of HIV awareness, which organisations within Scotland, other than sexual health services, should be promoting key messages around prevention, U equals U, chemsex, etc. And how can SX partner with those organisations to support their practice? I think there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. This uh, crew and HIV Scotland and um, others. <laughs> Chris, do you want to carry on? <laughs> I think the the main thing is, as we started this conversation, is that GBMSM can be such an intersectional community of so many different things that because sexual identities can appear in many different parts of life, it's important to partner with whoever needs that support and whoever is working with the public. So be that um, drugs charities, um, university counsellors, things like that. And I think it's everybody's responsibility to talk about U equals U because it's such a powerful, amazing message to tackle the stigma that the HIV positive community have faced for years. And I think when we talk about prevention, I would like to see a situation where sexual health isn't just barred off to sexual health services that it crops up in conversations all the time, whether it's your relating to your drug use, your alcohol use, your relationships, your mental health, they talk to you about your sexual health and what is available to you here in Scotland. But I think at Essex, we try and reach out to any community that we feel would benefit from our work. And also, we're always keen to hear back from other communities. So any knowledge or information sharing, we're always interested in. I think there's a there is a responsibility on um, wider health services as well. There's no reason why I shouldn't go into my GP surgery and be able to read a leaflet on managing my blood pressure, managing my diabetes, managing whatever long term condition I have, but then nothing about HIV or AIDS or nothing about good sexual health. It's every other health condition that you can the, the rarest genetic syndrome that you've ever heard of. There'll be a flyer on that, but not about um, U equals U. And I, th I think that SX do incredible work and these, these charities do incredible work, but we also need to remember the people outside of the, the, the community where some of this stigma really sits and how do we change those hearts and minds um, as well as educating the ones that within the community as well as the great work that SX do in uh, reaching out to those kind of intersections um, where we know people are increased vulnerability. I would love to walk into my GPs and see a flyer about chemsex. <laughs> this is this is this is how to do G safely. Okay. Um, well, I have really really enjoyed today's talk. Um, so I would just like to take the time to thank all of our panelists today. Thank you, Sam, Christopher, and Oliver, and thank you, Jen, for patiently moderating the background um, and helping everybody's questions come. And thank you, most importantly, to all of our audience today as well. I hope you've all found it as interesting as I have um, and that you've all learned something and you'll go off and share that information with the people and organizations in your life where it will make the most impact. So thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. See you later. Thank you.